Hello everyone, welcome to Retire With Style on this beautiful 4th of July. Hope you're all enjoying hot dogs and the American dream and uh, thanks to our uh, founding fathers, we have the ability to do so, right Wade? That's right, absolutely. Happy 4th of July everyone. Yeah, and uh, don't worry, I, we if you're listening to this during the day, we still got the fireworks with this podcast as we discuss drumroll, living benefits with fixed indexed annuities, registered index linked annuities known as RILAs, and uh, annuities as an accumulation tool for the the, the, the crescendo that's usually that's usually played with the 1812 overture. What do you think of those fireworks for today, Wade? <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a grab bag. There are a few different topics that don't really warrant having entire episodes devoted to them. So we're, and it's a little bit of a contrast because we're talking about living benefits first, but then we're shifting into uh, just overview of annuities without living benefits. So it's gonna be an exciting episode. The, the fireworks are definitely gonna be flying. <laughs> Let's start out with some sparklers. Let's start out with some sparklers. <laughs> well, actually, are you, are you planning on doing anything for the July? Uh, hopefully having some sort of barbecue and that sort of thing. Uh, that's the... Oh, really? The fireworks uh, where we live will be on Saturday. Well, past tense now. <laughs> Future past tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Saturday was our big fireworks uh, extravaganza. So There you go. All right. All right. We will have a parade on the morning. As this episode comes out, I may be marching with my son's Cub Scout. Uh, pack in the Fourth of July parade. Really, that's pretty cool. Will your yeah, are the kids be watching, or are you flying solo on that one? Sounds like they'd rather watch instead of participate. <laughs> but I thought they'd be excited to participate. I don't know. We'll see. Come on, man! You just get them out there. Don't even the I trick. It, the trick <laughs> in all my years of parenting. Don't ask. Just take them. Assume the sale, man. <laughs> Assume the sale. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be in, uh, actually, I'll be in Canada. I'll be in Ottawa of all places next week. I so, get there by July 1st to July. celebrate Canada Day. No, I'll miss that. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll be there July 3rd. I'm taking my, oh, my, yeah. my boys. Yeah, no, my boys are interning. They're going to be interning with uh, with our, our tech team over in Ottawa. So Wonderful. they're, they're going to get the ins and outs of uh, learning Figma and all of that stuff. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Uh, they're getting tired of creating the LinkedIn video. So they're, they're actually going to roll their sleeves up and do some work. But <laughs> that being the case, well, we haven't had chit chat in a while, huh? Our chit chat portion. <laughs> right. No, when I was in Japan, I was too tired to think about chit chat. <laughs> All right. I'm All right. Seat, so. so, so kick back, get that lawn chair, get that hot dog, put the mustard and ketchup, a beer or Coke, what have you. And put your earbuds in and away we go. Fire it off, Wade. <laughs> <laughs> so first topic is living benefits for fixed index annuities. Um, and and it, so we talked about living benefits for variable annuities in past episodes now, I guess a couple episodes ago at this point. It could work the same way for fixed index annuities, but I generally want to describe a different system that's out there as well because it's probably more common to find this other system with the uh, fixed index annuities. And so with the variable annuities we talked about, you have the benefit base, you could have a roll-up rate. And then if you achieve new high watermarks, you could also have step-up opportunities. Uh, the way I want to describe that's different because it's more common in the fixed index annuity world, since there may be less opportunity for step-ups beyond any sort of roll-up rate, uh, the way the living benefit might structure the guaranteed income is more, there'll be a withdrawal rate uh, linked to the age that you purchase the annuity. And then if you're deferring the start of income, the withdrawal rate will tend to increase over time. So maybe to give an example of that, suppose I'm in my early 60s, I get a fixed index annuity with a living benefit. At the particular age I am when the contract was issued, say the payout rate is 4.5%, but I'm not starting income. I'm going to have a deferral period before I turn on my lifetime income. And so just in this hypothetical example, each year I delay the start of my lifetime income, the withdrawal rate will increase by 0.3 percentage points. So then with 10 years, that would be a, a 3 percentage point deferral uh, 
increase in the withdrawal rate. So if it started at four and a half percent, I delay 10 years, then I turn on my lifetime income. Instead of worrying about benefit bases and roll-up rates, my payout rate, instead of being four and a half percent, would be seven and a half percent. And that's a more typical way you'd see the living benefits with a fixed index annuity work. Now, the reason you may not necessarily see step up opportunities as often is just to get a new high watermark. You need the upside potential to exceed any sort of contract costs, which would only be related to this living benefit. Or once you turn on the lifetime income, uh, the distributions as well. These days, kind of the example we're using in this discussion is an FIA with a cap rate of 12%. So you might actually, in the early years, if you're getting good market returns and you're hitting that 12% cap, you could get some step-up opportunities there early on, but you don't necessarily have enough growth potential where as soon as you have a year where you may not get your full cap, <laughs> cap rate credited to the account, you might start to fall behind and then it would become difficult to subsequently achieve a new high watermark. Wait, uh, I, I, I want to stop you right there. And, and, and I, I could be off and you can feel free to say, no, no, we're good. I was listening to what you were saying. And again, I'm thinking about consumers listening in. And yes, there's consumers that are well versed, but you know, the reality is annuities can get complicated. And uh, you were using roll up rate and step up rates, th those terms, do we need to revisit just the definition of the, of the, of, of, of the step up rate and the roll up rate just to make sure that that's clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we could, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. The roll up rate was that when, when you have the explicit benefit base, it's a fixed rate of return that the benefit base would increase each year during the deferral period. It's what causes the confusion sometimes with variable annuities that say you have a roll-up rate of 7%. Sometimes people think they have a, a guaranteed rate of return of 7%. And that's, as we talked about, that's not what a roll-up rate is. It's simply increasing the benefit base by 7% a year. And then when you turn on the income, your withdrawal rate, the payout rate of the annuity is applied to that benefit base. And so the roll-up rate does help you get a higher income. What's different about step-ups is there's no fixed step-up rate or anything. It's simply connected to, does the contract achieve a new high watermark on dates that you're allowed to look for that? So, so if it's a one-year term, every year on the anniversary, has the contract achieved a new high value so that the benefit base would be higher in the context of if there is a benefit base or if there's well, with a fixed index annuity, the, because of principal protection, generally, you're, you won't, you're going to be close to your, before you turn on income, you're going to be close to being at the, the high watermark level. But do you achieve a higher value for the contract that's never been experienced in the past? And then your benefit base would reset Am to I that correct? high value. And that high watermark is achieved if that underlying index increased or not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so before you turn on income, it's easy to achieve new high watermarks because you just need enough growth that the contract grows. Now it, it can't shrink, but if you're, if you have an optional guaranteed lifetime withdrawal benefit, there is a fee for that, that would reduce the contract values. Say in the example, we'll talk about eventually, I'm using an example of a one and a half, a 1.1% uh, guaranteed lifetime withdrawal benefit fee. So that would reduce the contract value by 1.1% a year. So if as long as you're gaining a little bit more than that, uh, in terms of credited interest, you would be achieving new high watermarks. The, 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 the other point I'd like to say, and, and we said this in, in a previous episode, and I want to make sure it's relevant here. It, it may not be. You said, uh, you know, let's say it's a 4.5% payout at issue and it increases by 0.3% for each deferral year. Uh, the question that somebody could be asking is, is there a right number of years to let defer before you accept it? You know, uh, is there magic to that? I, when I asked you something similar last time, you had said, no, just take it as soon as it's available because it's priced fine. You know, it's priced accordingly, et cetera, et cetera. What, if someone was listening to that statement, when you said every year you extend it, it's 0.3%. And then after 10 years, it's 7.5%. Someone could be thinking, 
well, should I, by habit, always defer as much as I can or, or not? No, the answer is always usually um, start income sooner rather than later. No, but there's no reason to start income if you're not retired yet. Like you don't necessarily. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> so given the caveat that you're retired, uh, there's no real point to continue deferral for those types of credits. It's okay to go ahead and start income. And what you do want to do is comparison shop and always at least look at a deferred income annuity with the same situation of whatever age I am when I purchase, how long I'm intending to defer, what is the payout rate that the deferred income annuity would provide, compare that to what the fixed index annuity would provide. The fixed index annuity payout rate might be less, but then also then you have to further elaborate on, well, will the contract value grow <laughs> in the, the fixed index annuity such that even if the payout rate was a little bit less, when you multiply that by that higher contract value I, slash benefit base, but I, I don't necessarily use the term benefit base, uh, that could still provide more income. And that's how you'd make the comparison between different options. But generally the idea of increasing, getting these deferral credits, it's not usually worth it to delay just because you can get more deferral credits. And also those deferral credits may end at some point. You're generally, if you're thinking to not turn on income for more than 10 years, the, the fixed index annuity might ultimately, you, you've got to compare, but it may not be the best option for that type of scenario. And the other piece, just again, this is one of these for abundance of clarity because of the, the, you know, the annuity world, if you will. We're speaking here not about the annuitization of the annuity. We're speaking here about the guaranteed living withdrawal benefit. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're, lots we're of talking about activating too. the rider, if you will. Say it again. Yes, yeah, so we're doing a lot of callbacks to previous episodes. Annuitization is rare. Uh, when you have the simple income annuity, the single premium immediate annuity, or the deferred income annuity, you annuitize those contracts. That is an irreversible decision that behaviorally many people are not comfortable with. So that's why since the 1990s, the insurance world has created deferred annuities with living benefits that allow you to turn on lifetime income without annuitizing the contract. So you're not annuitizing the contract. You still have liquidity for the underlying va contract value. If you want to get your money back, you, you would sacrifice the guarantee by getting your money out of more than you're allowed to distribute. Uh, but uh, you have that flexibility to do so if you want. And the way the living benefit works, you're spending your own money, but if, by doing that, you spend the contract value down to zero. That triggers the uh, effectively a type of annuitization or the, the annuity enters a settlement phase where the insurance company is now on the hook to continue paying that guaranteed amount defined by the contract through that, that withdrawal rate um, as it was applied to the, the but, high watermark. But the amount of income that value. someone's getting right now that you were describing in this example is from the writer which is another way to say the, the, the guaranteed living yes. withdrawal benefit. The rider allows you to take out a certain amount each year. And as long as you take out that amount or less, the, the contract will protect that amount of future spending. And then you're spending your own money up to the allowed amount. But the, the idea is if you spend down your contract value to zero, then the insurance company is on the hook to continue paying that same allowed amount each year for the rest of your life. So then conceptually, and I'm going to lead into where you're going with this, conceptually here, the assets haven't been annuitized, so you still have liquidity with regard to them. And the rider is could be fairly healthy from the income you can receive because it's based on the performance of, you know, the, the index that the that the initial contract was based on that in itself may provide something that's very competitive to other types of annuity that are somewhat a little more irreversible at times. Mm -hmm. Right. In, in theory, the highest payout rate should come from the, the SPIA DIA world, the, the single premium immediate annuity or deferred income annuity because you, you don't have any upside potential with those and you don't have any liquidity with those. It's that irreversible annuitization. 
And so as Ginny said, you don't get... those are the annuities you annuitize. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> that's right. And since you don't, yeah, that was our LinkedIn commercial for that episode. <laughs> and since you don't get any of these extra benefits, the, the trade-off is you should get a higher guaranteed income. That being said, though, there is this behavioral element with the fixed index annuities where with a, an immediate annuity, because you have no discretion, you can't make any mistake. You're, you're going to get that monthly check. You don't have to do anything. And that monthly check is delivered to you. Uh, so you can't screw it up. With a fixed index annuity, sometimes people pay for the protection. They pay for the living benefit. But then they don't distribute the amount that they're allowed to distribute. And if they don't distribute the amount they're allowed to distribute, that makes it less likely that the account will ever deplete. And if it's less likely that the account will ever deplete, it's less likely that the insurance company will ever be on the hook to pay you the, the benefits that they're collecting the rider fee to be able to insure and protect you. So then through competition, because some people are behaviorally not using these in the most effective way, uh, they can offer a higher payout rate than the uh, SPIA or the DIA. And uh, Moshe Malevsky was one of the first people to point that out with, uh, <laughs> it's been quite a while where I think his, his mother's neighbor was talking to her about a fixed index annuity that beat other options. And he couldn't believe that was possible. But after looking into it, he, he saw that, yes, it's, <laughs> it's really this behavioral aspect where people are not using the FIA as efficiently as they could and so the more informed consumers doing that uh, can benefit from higher payout rates potentially, or at least in theory, fixed index annuities, they give you liquidity and upside potential. So they should give you a lower downside guarantee. In reality, they may also give you a, a competitive higher or pretty much the same type of payout rate as the SPIA or the DIA is doing. So, so for somebody, for those of us uh, keeping score at home, uh when the what, what do you think when it when that inflection point comes when you're thinking about it and let's bring it back to the resa right let's say you're in income protection right you take the resa and you're in the income protection uh quadrant f do you comparison shop fias spias and dias or or not mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you're more likely in income protection you're, you're going to be interested in that fixed annuity world more so than the variable annuity world. And so, yeah, that, that's what you're looking at, the, the SPIAs and the DIAs, and really those just immediate annuities and then the, the fixed index annuities with living benefits are the main tools you're going to want to compare and contrast and, and make your decision around. How am I doing, Wade? Am I getting it? You're, you're nailing it. <laughs> <laughs> Like Nadia Comaneci coming off the pole vault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a much better interviewer than me, as probably our listeners are noticing from some of our other episodes. No, not even. <laughs> Trust me, they don't want it the other way around. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's not that funny, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, want to talk about how they manage risk. Or the insurance. Oh. <laughs> Look at you giving me a softball. <laughs> well, I mean, remember from the beginning, right? Uh, the last podcast that we had. Uh, remember, we do we're, we're doing two sets of podcasts. This one on the, the, on the annuity uh, trajectory, fixed index annuities. Remember the, the the keyword is fixed, right? And it's fixed in the sense of it's fixed at zero. I won't go below that. And so they come with uh, principal protection from that vantage point. So uh, that's one way to, to simply manage risk. You want a little bit of that upside, but here you're able to, to lock in the risk, risk being anything below zero, right? Uh, less than yeah, zero, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> like, like the book. Uh, <laughs> adjusted guaranteed payouts, you get your payouts handed to well, you. Yeah, a little bit more on that one. The, uh, the living, ahead. like the, the living benefits on fixed index annuities may be less expensive than the living benefits on variable annuities. Because of the variable annuity, the insurance company has to manage both market risk and longevity risk. Uh, with a fixed index annuity, the insurance company only has to manage the, long, the longevity risk because they know the worst case scenario because of the principal protection and all the bonds that are oh, that's backing right. that. There's no downside protection. volatility to manage. Yeah. 
Yeah, they know the worst case market scenario. Uh, they'll know exactly when the contract value will deplete because it would just be credited interest for zero every year. <laughs> then they can track out, okay, how long will the money last? That's the worst case scenario. They don't have to worry about if the market's down 20, 30, 40% or anything like that. So that does make it easier to manage. The, um, the risk the insurance company takes to provide that income guarantee, they only have to worry about longevity, not about the market risk. Any other ways to manage risk other than, I mean, you can adjust here the yeah, guaranteed are. payout rate. Uh huh. Yeah, playing around. Before I was rudely interrupted. <laughs> right, you were just flying through that, but uh, <laughs> wanted to add a little detail. There's not much to add about. Yes, they can play around with the the guaranteed payout rate as well. Any other ideas, Alex? Uh, let me see here. <laughs> what slide are we by here? Oh yes. No, no, no. You can increase. You can increase option on living benefit rider fees as well. You know, you get that sort of. Uh, you know, you, you begin to be able to look at this in windows of time and you can get an increase on that mm -hmm. you know, based on the performance. And then the other the thing like. they can, and we, we talked about that idea of the options budget where once you've purchased enough bonds to protect principal with the remaining funds, the insurance company keeps part of that for themselves and they use the, that to purchase the upside exposure. They could tweak that to keep a little more for themselves, a little bit less for the upside exposure. And then the other thing we talked about is it's necessary for the insurance company to adjust these parameters at the end of each term, because the whole process starts over each term of the contract. They have to buy enough bonds to protect principal. Well, as interest rates change, the amount needed to do that will change. And then the cost of financial derivatives is changing over time. And, and so, they have to, with the remainder, purchase the upside exposure. And because of that, caps or whatever, however the upside is defined, that needs to be able to evolve over time to deal with changing market conditions. But 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 I think you're saying something interesting here uh, from the standpoint of institutional risk management. So again, you go back to the example from the last week, let's say you have $100 to play with, right? Effectively, the... And let's say the interest rates are 5%. It's not going to be exactly because I should have done like 101 or something like that. But let's just say it's $100 to play with. Interest rates are 5%, right? And so what the insurance company does is they buy, usually the bonds are like strips. So the bonds will mature at 100, but you buy them at 95, you know, kind of thing based on a 5% interest rate. So you spend $95 in bonds, and that will assure you that at that end point in time, you'll have $100, and that's how they, it's math at that point. That's how they, and assuming it's government bonds, you know, that risk-free bonds, et cetera. That's how they can guarantee that you're going to get the hundred dollars at the end of the period and know that you'll have zero. You know, they'll, they'll be, you, you won't get less than zero. You'll get back the principal. That's how they do it. That's the magic behind it. Mm -hmm. Now, the $5, and again, the options budget is predicated on the interest rates, right? But the effectively, the $5 is the options budget defined as that's how much they have to play with to go to the option market and buy now exposure to the indexes via options. And the options are dated, probably they're going to be most likely aligned to the end point, right? But the insurance company is not going to spend the full $5. They're going to spend maybe a dollar and a half, you know, a dollar fifty. So they'll buy, Hopefully they'll buy more three dollars and <laughs> I'm just making it up. Wait, I don't know. You know what I mean? Or, or no, it, no, that's, that's, how, the much, that's how much, that's how much they're keeping to themselves. Oh, they'll keep, they're they'll keeping a dollar yeah, fifty to maybe. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. If I said yeah. it the wrong way, I said it the wrong way. <laughs> they keep a dollar fifty to themselves for those wonderful commercials that you see on TV. Now for the admin <laughs> and stuff like that. I'm sure there's some marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll spend the three fifty going to the mm -hmm. options market and, you know, buying the options for the exposure and whatever that budget is that's that lets them say 80 percent market exposure 70 percent market exposure because you know they're limited by how much wiggle room they have around that even though that may sound overly complicated it's it's not in the you know in the conceptual sense of things and it's 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 pretty stable that that sort of dynamic it's not some magical thinking kind of thing in which they're engineering these returns Right. And, and I, I think there's some, you can take solace in that. Wait. Yeah. And sometimes uh, self-directed investors will talk about how you could just create your own fixed index annuity. 
And that's true. You can follow that same approach yourself if it, you got to deal with the options market. But then you can't not on the living. You can recreate. Side. No, you can't recreate the living benefit on your own. That requires risk pooling that an individual can't do by themselves. You can replicate the uh, return structure on the fixed index annuity on your own, but you cannot replicate the living benefit lifetime income protection on your own. I, I would think, yeah, and you can replicate it to the degree that. If not with a hundred dollars, maybe your budget, oh, yeah, your investable <laughs> assets, you know, a hundred thousand, you know, you're, you're talking now orders of magnitude significantly greater than the hundred, but yeah, that's but there's some safety in that. Uh, there, there, again, it's not a Joan Didion or whatever, there's no magical thinking behind it where you, you know, these mortgage backed securities and there's these levels of mortgages, and if one falls, it's a domino. That's not what you're talking about here. It, it's kind of pretty vanilla, really. But mm -hmm. uh, there it is, right? Yeah, that's the fixed index annuity. Great. Uh, <laughs> what else we have? That's that's the first. That's the first. So, uh, those are the sparklers, or, or is that the Roman candle? Did we just shoot off the Roman candle? Let's get the black cats now and, and talk yeah, about uh, registered index the linked annuities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we want to add some risk. We got to. Yeah, yeah. We're not gonna, now go. we're risking blowing our fingers off or blowing our eye out or something here. Because now we're adding. Wow, wait. That, that, got, <laughs> that got morbid real fast. Wait. What kind of childhood did you have, man? <laughs> wow. You went from yeah, sparklers to, to getting maimed. <laughs> we're using the, the potato guns to, <laughs> to try that to have any. Dude, those are crazy. Oh, my good. I tried to catch one once. I remember oh. <laughs> someone shot it up in the air, and I, for some reason, I thought I could catch the potato. <laughs> I wasn't close, so I, I survived. But it's kind of well, like you still have all your limbs, <laughs> yeah, fortunately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, registered index linked annuities. These are they became popular just much more recently, as you can see with the fixed index annuity. The interest rates really matter. When interest rates got extremely low, the now they're rising again, which we're in a better world now. But when they were, when we, like in 2020, when the 10-year treasury rate was down at 0.6%, you don't have any upside after you protect the principal. And so you were seeing cap rates on fixed index annuities in the ballpark of like two or 3% even. Now today I tend to use 12% as the, the baseline number for like a 12% cap. But back when there was a 2% cap, that was not necessarily exciting for people. And so what the registered index linked annuity does, it allows the owner to accept some downside risk, but in exchange to have more upside potential. And so back several years ago, FIA caps may have been at around two or 3% registered index linked annuities might've had caps uh, with like a 10% buffer. And we'll talk about what that means, but caps in the ballpark of, of 10 to 12%. Today, the example I use, fixed index annuity, principal protection, 12% cap, a registered index linked annuity with a 10% buffer, 28% cap. So we need to explain what that buffer is, but it's you're taking some downside risk, but in exchange, you've got more upside potential. So it's really a way to give you a broader menu of options about that structured return how much downside risk are you willing to accept? And then how much upside potential are you able to receive? As an aside, it also shows you the imp how, how important this sort of idea or concept of the risk-free rate is. Because it, it just, it just I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but for folks, it just touches everything, right? Like it, it affected this whole dynamic between FIAs and RILAs. Just the fact that, you know, as rates increase, Boom, you have now so much flexibility, you know, around that. Although, you know, it, it hinders other things, but it's just, it has its tentacles on everything. This sort of basic concept in finance literally touches everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's yeah, my... it's, when interest rates are very low, <laughs> it was kind of the statement you have to take more risk to have upside potential. And, and yeah, you see that yeah. in the annuity world. And in that regard, um, so, the registered index linked annuity, it, it has a lot of different names. They're also called like structured annuities, buffered annuities. Uh, registered index linked annuity is not the most attractive name, but you get to abbreviate it as a RILA, 
And so that's, Ryla sounds nice. Uh, and Ryla's, they, they're technically variable annuities because you're exposed to the risk of loss. That's what makes them different from fixed annuities. Uh, but otherwise, aside from the, the risk of loss and the, the fact that they're classified as variable annuities, they really work in the same general way. It's you're you're still using as a bonds fixed to index provide annuity. Mm -hmm. Yes, as as a fixed index annuity. In terms of you're linking to a yeah. market index, and you're going to receive a structured return uh, related to that market index that moves you away from the bell curve distribution of the market index into some sort of return structured around that. That's not a bell curve anymore. That's mm -hmm got some limits or some impacts on what the downside looks like and what the upside looks like. They're effectively adjusting the tails on both ends of the curve. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and there's different ways that RILAs can be structured. The, the simplest way is just with floors. An FIA has a floor of 0% principal protection. Well, you could have, say, a RILA with a 10% floor, negative 10% floor which would mean you're exposed to losses to up to negative 10%. If the market was down 5%, you'd have a 5% loss. If the market was down 25%, you'd have a 10% loss. You, you're, you have a risk of loss down to where the floor is. And the reason you might accept that is because now I only have to buy enough bonds if, if with a 10%, negative 10% floor. I only have to buy enough bonds to protect 90% of the principal, not 100% of the principal. So that leaves me a, a lot more left over for the options budget to buy upside potential. Now, in all the simulations I've done, and I, I think this is generally agreed upon, the RILA with the floor doesn't seem to test very well. It's, it's not necessarily all that attractive of an option. Uh, where, where, why, what's more exciting? Why is that? <laughs> I don't know. It's just the... Uh, you don't necessarily get that much benefit from it in terms of how it changes the distribution of returns and then how vulnerable you are to, to the, like, you're not getting, there's more, when you have losses, they tend to fall in the level between 0% and where the floor is. So you end up experiencing more of the uh, losses, but then there's you, not that you. many cases where the losses are extremely worse than what the floor protects. Got you. And with the upside you give up there, it's just over time, it doesn't really play out well in the simulations. And is 10% loss like, kind of like the normal floor? Well, it's, uh, it could be other. You could have a 20%. And well, I was thinking, so with the floor, was it's always negative, like around. negative 20% loss. Yeah, so I, was like I was thinking like a 5%. I was thinking like negative 5%. I was thinking uh, going the other yeah, way. Yeah, I don't, could. I haven't, don't, haven't really seen that one too much. I have seen like a negative, a negative 40% it, floor. Yeah, but, but what's the point? If you're getting right <laughs> at that point, you're if you're saying a negative ten point cent is too low, yeah, and if you're saying a ten percent is too low at a negative, what what good with a negative forty percent? Well, a negative well forty percent in the floor. market. Or no, it's it's really then it's really just becoming in. No, I'm sorry. Uh, you're right. Yeah, then you might as well just invest in the market because you're only protecting against losses <laughs> that are beyond negative forty percent. You know, we have, this recorded, we have this recorded, Wade. We have this recorded, Wade. I've got you, Wade. I've yeah, got yeah, I was, you. I was, I was mixed up there. <laughs> you got it. You're right. No, Just no, no, in no, no. <laughs> hey, man, I've been listening to this podcast, Retire with Style. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of the buffer, but we were talking about floors still. So you're right. <laughs> Right, what about the? Uh, that's why I said five percent. Why not five percent? You know, because go the other way. Uh, all right. So buffers. So there's floors. What's a buffer? And not a buffer asset that you always get me on. No, no, this is not a buffer asset. This is a, a buffer. <laughs> so the if the we'll use 10% buffer as the example, but you this is you could have a 40% buffer, and then that's effectively what I was saying. That's the same as an FIA almost. But a 10% a buffer or any buffer, you eat losses, the, the annuity eats losses up to that amount, and then you're exposed to any loss beyond that. So if I have a 10% buffer, and, and as a, we didn't say that yet in this episode, but we did say it in past episodes, because this is all based on financial derivatives. We're talking about the price returns of the index, not the total returns. You don't get the dividend payments. So if the price, re, if you're linked to the S&P 500, the price return was negative 5%, and you have a 10% buffer, 
you're credited with zero. The, the insurance company eats that 5% loss, gives you zero. If the market was down 13%, the 10% buffer protected the first 10% of the loss, and you'd be credited with a negative 3% return for the year. If the market was down 27%, you'd be credited with a 17% loss. The annuity eats the first 10% of losses you're exposed to any loss beyond that. That's what the buffer does. But by accepting that risk, you get more upside potential. There's there's going to be more ability to, that's like I said, the 10% buffer, I tend to talk about with an example using a 28% cap. Whereas the FIA these days I talk about as an example with a 12% cap, you get more upside potential. If the market's up 20%, the RILA in this case would give you the 20% price return gain. The FIA would have capped you at 12%. So that's the trade-off. And these do test a lot better in the types of simulations that I look at in terms of, because there are more small negative losses that happen in the markets, protecting against those gives you enough juice that even though you don't get the full upside exposure, you can still have a pretty good performance. Now, when the stock market does very well, stocks are always going to be the highest performing asset. So so then real quick, and so people thinking about this because they may have forgotten, oh, wait, what is the floor again? You know, that kind of thing. So if you have a 10% floor, if the market goes down 7%, you're, you're down 7%. You're down 7%. Yeah, no, no, you're down 7%. Mm -hmm. If you have a 10% buffer, the market goes down 7%, you're at zero. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's it's right. only anything above and beyond 10%. And so conceptually, you can see why that makes sense that that the results turn out better in the buffer than in the floor. Because as Wade said earlier, most of these losses happen in, you know, 5% here, 7% there, 8% there, you know, that, that kind of thing. And so you're constantly getting dinged that nominal amount as a, in the floor as opposed to in a buffer where you're, right. you know, you have that FIA kind of vibe for those, for those uh, return outputs. Wait, did I say anything off there? I just want to conceptually. No, kind of no, that's right. Anyway. And um, just another point to that as well. David Blanchett, uh, it was the first time I saw anyone do these estimates and then, said, oh, that was a good idea. Let me try that too. get similar kind of estimates. Uh, a RILA with a 10% buffer behaves kind of like a 60-40 portfolio, 60%. So it's S&P 500, 60%. Oh, yeah. I see what. S&P 500, 40% bonds. But it's still a structured return, so it's not exactly the same. But when you kind of look at, well, what's the upside potential? What's the downside risk? The RILA with a 10% buffer behaves a lot like a 60-40 portfolio, whereas a RILA with a 10% floor behaves more like a 40-60 a portfolio. But still not, I, that's only an approximation since... There's no bell curve distribution with these structured returns. Now, RILAs, because I'm, I'm I'm just thinking this and throw it out there because someone could be thinking, we talked about withdrawal benefits with FIEs and the like. With RILAs, that's not as relevant. Why would that be, Wade? Or it can be, but I just want you to kind of... Could you say the question again? What was... <laughs> With Rylas, he was looking at, well, let me backtrack. Blanchett was looking at it, but Blanchett or yourself, I would imagine you didn't include a, a withdrawal benefit within your calculations, you know, within that. You're just not, looking at not for that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're just looking at the dynamic of the actual underlying function of the Right, of right. how the RILA behaves, but, you know, as opposed the, the to the structure no component return. there. Yeah, there's no component there from an income perspective, is, is I guess the way I'm trying to say that in your analysis. Right, yeah, those are always separate conversations. That's exactly. how, how we did it with the FIA as well. We talked about the how the returns are created. And then separately, you can add an optional lifetime uh, income benefit to it. Same with the RILA. But yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. we're not talking about the income benefits. We're simply talking about just, the structured returns. I asked it very clumsily, you know, trying to make that demarcation for everyone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, actually... How are you seeing, <laughs> how do you see Rylas being used a lot in practice? Or, or does this, I, I, I guess where I'm going with it, and I'll just say it as opposed to asking a question, hoping you would answer it the way I want. Does this present a view <laughs> of how annuities could be used as accumulation tools, perhaps? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Rylas may have some play with total returns because simply with the way they're structured, people might think about them as an asset class in their portfolio in the total return perspective as well. Or as a risk graph approach, you might look at the RILA because you, you do expect more upside growth potential over time but with a living benefit attached to it so that you also have the protected guaranteed lifetime income. So they're definitely, the, if someone's thinking, do I want an FIA or do I want a RILA? And in both contexts, always trying to frame these as more of a bond replacement instead of a stock replacement. The more probability based you are, uh, with your RISA style, the more you might look at the RILA. The, the more safety first you are with your RISA style, the more you might look at the fixed index annuity. Was that the 1812 crescendo? <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, that definitely the RILA is the, um, the riskiest. Well, well, we can, I think, yeah, if we, as we go towards the end of this episode, just kind of talk a little bit more about annuities as accumulation tools, because there's a few other options too. That Great might tell. be our big Christian. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so yeah, annuities, we generally, or I, I don't know, we is not the right, I, I generally like to think of them more for their income protections. And that goes back to the addition, the original definition of an annuity was something to be annuitized to provide a stream of payments. But with the US tax code, annuities provide tax deferral. And that's led to the all the creation around different types of, where you might just think of annuities as accumulation tools. And then also with these structured returns, they can be an interesting accumulation tool as well, just as a way to move from the fact uh, bonds can experience losses. We saw that in 2022. If you had the FIA, the, the S&P 500 also experienced a big loss in 2022 the FIA would have been credited with 0% while the uh, stock and bonds had double digit losses. Uh, so you, you can see where there can be that downside protection, which in an accumulation portfolio can be attractive as well. But if we just list different annuities that you might consider in the context, not for lifetime income, but more as an accumulation asset class, either for structured return or for the, the tax deferral benefit, you do have, you've got the multi-year guaranteed annuities or, or MIGAs. Those are kind of the, the CD equivalent of the annuity world. It provides a fixed rate of return for a fixed term. You've got other deferred fixed annuities that are you're not annuitizing the contract. They'll pay a fixed rate of return over a given term. They're really the same sort of thing as a MIGA. You got the fixed index annuities, which can then give you that range of returns linked to the index performance. You've got the registered index linked annuities, which we just talked about, a, a wider range of returns linked to uh, an index performance. Then in the, the pure variable annuity space, you could have a variable annuity with a guaranteed minimum accumulation benefit that will simply provide downside protection. So if I've Say if I hold this annuity for 10 years, it might guarantee that in the worst case scenario, the worst I can do is I'll have a 5% gain. And then I'll have any gains beyond that. And that would be, I'm investing in sub accounts. So I do get dividends as mm -hmm. well. I would just be paying a writer fee that would cut into some of the uh, potential upside from that. And then you've got the investment only variable annuities, which are annuities designed to be no frills, trying to have very low uh, cost, like low mortality and expense charges, so that you can use them for the tax deferral with tax inefficient asset classes. Now, all the income that comes out of the annuity is taxed as ordinary income. So you wouldn't want to put tax efficient <laughs> uh, stock market indices with long term capital gains. You'd lose that benefit. But whenever you have a tax inefficient asset class, you might want tax that deferral like for that. Beyond... Or that, that would be mm -hmm. like bonds, you know, things like that. Yeah, and if you ran out of space in your um, IRAs and Roth IRAs and so forth, then you might look more, at an more power to only you. variable <laughs> annuity. <laughs> yeah, you fill up your 401k allotments and, and you still want more tax deferral. So that's that's another option is a, a low cost investment only variable annuity. Yeah. 
Yeah, for the the 4th of July, that's probably enough content for today. And some of the other things we're thinking to to talk about might fit better in, in separate episodes. So excellent. All right, wait. Well, uh, everyone, I hope you've gotten more than one hot dog or burger while we've been speaking. You deserved it if you made it through this one. But uh, again, thank you for listening. Always a pleasure and enjoy the 4th, everyone. Absolutely, Tchaikovsky. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. All right. Move over, Beethoven. All right. Later, everyone.